So over these past couple of nights, I've been just diving more into learning about Kubernetes. And one of the things that I looked into was learning how to do logging, right? So when you have a bunch of different pods running in your cluster, it's kind of a pain to have to go in every single pod and like look at the logs. So right now I'm, I'm using the uh, Kubernetes slash Minikube dashboard and you can view the logs of individual pods, but there's no way to like see an overall view of what the logs look like. But basically I spent like two nights trying to figure out how to set up Grafana, Loki, and Promtail, which is a collection of tools that you can use in your Kubernetes cluster to basically get all the logs for all your pods and kind of dive and explore over them, right? Um, now this was more of a pain to set up than I thought it was gonna be. Like I had to read through these docs, I tried different blog posts and I just kept running into roadblock after roadblock. But anyway, how this works is when you set this all up, you get this dashboard. This is a Grafana dashboard and it's hooked into a data source called Loki. Okay, so Loki is running in my cluster. And basically Loki is a service that is gonna aggregate all your logs from your different pods. So how do the logs get from the pods to your Loki data source? Well, there's another thing that's installed as a, I think it's called a daemon set, and that's called Promtail. So basically that hooks into all your pods, listens for the logs, and then it ships those logs over to Loki. I don't know the fine details of what Loki does. I just know that it collects your logs, it does stuff with it, and then somehow your Grafana dashboard can hook into that to view your logs. So for example, if I want to search over my application called Key Value App, I can go ahead and run a query. Don't know why it failed the first time, um, but there's no logs right now. So if I wanted to create something, if I go to like Thunder Client, right there. So I went ahead and stored one. I'll go ahead and get one. And that should hopefully print out some logs, which if I were to go ahead and click live here, you'll see those logs pop up in your Grafana dashboard. Again, these are logs that are aggregated from all four of my pods. I have a replica of four right now. Like if I go to um, my deployments and look at key value app, you'll see I have replicas of four somewhere. Here it is, four pods. Now, honestly, that's the extent of my knowledge with how to even use this tool. I do believe you can come in here and you can add more filters and add more like um, conditions. If you wanna get fine grain um, filters, you can do that. I think text define, like if I were to do like, I don't know, keys, Z, 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 um, that'll filter down for that. So if I were to change this to like YOLO and do a get request, change this to YOLO, there we go. We get our log, we get our timestamp, and yeah. So how did I set this up? It was actually really hard. I don't know why it was so hard. I, I jumped around from different blog posts to learning about different things and like configurations. It kind of sucked. Um, but now that I've done it, it's not as hard as it I thought it was. So basically, the first thing you do is you install Grafana. You can come to this Grafana Labs or Grafana.com. Um, they have a installation on Kubernetes right here. Let's just click that. And really all you do is you just like create a namespace. That's something new I learned over the past couple, past couple days is basically you can create a namespace and that is going to put all your resources under one grouping, right? So all my Grafana stuff is under a Grafana namespace. We have a Loki namespace. And what this allows you to do is let's say you have hundreds of services or resources that are in that namespace. All you need to do is go to cube control and delete that namespace and I'll wipe out all those resources. So you don't have to manually go through one by one and like delete them. You can just delete the whole namespace and restart if you need to. Okay, so they're saying create a namespace, call it Grafana or whatever, and then you make a Grafana YAML file. So let's look at that, Grafana YAML. And I just copied as is. I don't think there's anything in here I had to update or change, but this does set up a persistent volume claim. So it has some location it can write stuff to. Um, and then you basically just apply it, right? So just apply that and that'll set up the Grafana dashboard. And once you've done that, you can do a port forward to your cluster so that you have access to see it on port 3000, right? So that's kind of what we're doing here. All right, so that's the first step is you have to set up Grafana so that you can see the logs. The next step is you have to install something called Loki. So going here, they have a Helm recommended setup. I believe I did the install monolithic Loki. Um, I found that easier than doing the scalable one. Um, actually, I don't know which one I did. Let's see, let's go to values. Yeah. So basically, again, you just add the Helm charts for Grafana. You create this file here. Now, I did have to set auth enabled false. I wasted so much time trying to figure out why Grafana couldn't contact Loki, and this was the key. So I had to disable auth. That's probably documented in the fine print somewhere. I just couldn't find it. 
And then they have some like side quest stuff for like if you want to connect to S3, don't care about that. But then somewhere in here, I believe, um, yeah, you just you just run Helm install. You pass it that file. You pass the thing you want to install with Helm, which is Loki and Grafana Loki, I believe. And then you also just give it a namespace. And that installs Loki for you, okay? All right, so there's a third thing you have to install, and that is called Promtail. So this is, again, that daemon set that runs over all your pods, collects logs, and ships it to Loki. So same idea. You basically run a Helm update install. Um, and then you grab all this configuration. And there is this URL here. You basically change this URL, and you need to point it to your loki gateway namespace so one thing i want to share with you that i learned that i think is important is when you get your services so i'm basically saying get all the services in the namespace of loki you get a list of your services right all of these have a host name in kubernetes right so if you wanted to have one pod access another pod the host name would look like this you do http dot colon slash slash you do the name then you do the namespace so it's either loki just because that's what our namespace is or it's default um, defaults what we use in other places so we'll do loki and then you say service you do cluster local okay so that is the host name or the url that you'd end up using um, if you want one pod to connect to another um, in this case this is what you need to basically put there you put that whole loki gateway and then you add that suffix at the end so it knows what endpoint to hit and at that point i think everything is set up um, the last step is i had to go into grafana and I had to set up a data source. So over here, you can go to data sources. You can type in Loki. And then you basically click it. You have to put that URL that we talked about like this. And then you click save and test, which is at the bottom. And I'm pretty sure I also wasted hours trying to figure out like, this wasn't working. And the reason it wasn't working was, again, all to that security flag I had to turn off. All right, so that kind of wraps up the Loki thing. I do want to speak about the application slash project I'm working on. Again, this is just all so I can learn more about Kubernetes. That's the goal. Learn about Kubernetes, and the best way to do that is to build something. And so, again, what I'm building, if you haven't caught up in the last videos, is a key value application, right? So basically, I'm building my own Redis. I'm building my own, like, I don't know, distributed MongoDB. This is the first approach I started doing, um, which you could see in a previous video, where basically I have all of these pods. They all have an in memory cache of a key and a value. And as you store keys, we store that into the cache. And then we also write those values to disk. So we have some durability. Now, the issue with this approach is that when I deployed to DigitalOcean, you can't have multiple pods mount to this block storage device. You can only have one. And where that's defined down here, if I go to volume claims, there's this read write once. This is the only thing that DigitalOcean provides. There's another option called read write mini. And according to what I've Googled, there's only like one cloud service that pro provides this. It's like IBM or some other service or something. I don't know. But basically, this put a limitation on my design because now I can't just share a, a block storage device between these, these pods. I have to either bring in an NFS and set that up in my cluster. Or I need to have some type of centralized database with an API so they can all read and write from that centralized place. So I decide, you know what, this is not even a scalable solution because... Again, we have a single point of failure, which is RabbitMQ. All of these pods are kind of reliant on this message broker to know when cache needs to be invalidated. It probably isn't the best. And then having all of these depend on a centralized data store is probably not good if we're trying to build out a distributed key value store. Okay, so I kind of wrote down the pros and cons of like this approach. The main ones were, I think this is going to be a slower approach because as you have more requests everything's just going to keep on publishing events to this and you're going to hit a limitation with like this message broker, I believe. And then also like you can't share data from a disk here. So I decided to readdress what I'm doing and I want to actually learn more about sharding and partitioning. So the new approach is I'm going to try to make a API node in Go and basically it does the same logic, but each of these or their own stateful set. So this is something new that um, I probably need to talk about. What is a stateful set? Which basically means that they're not just ephemeral, right? You have to keep these services around. They're attached to a, a disk, a block storage device, and they all have their own storage ca capabilities, right? Let me get rid of that Etsy. We're not doing, using, using that anymore. All right, so let's look at deployment YAML and see that this is now a stateful set. Um, basically, it looks the same as it did before. Um, there's a little bit of minor changes. But we're saying give us four nodes, give us four pods, and they're all going to have their own volume storage device. And so instead of them all trying to share the same storage device, they're all going to get their own. 
And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to partition the data based on the key. So basically when someone makes a request here, we look at this key, the testing key, and then we need to use that when it hits the API to figure out if the data is gonna live on this current API node or if the data needs to be forwarded to a different node which would have the data. So basically what happens is that there's something called a hash ring where when the key comes in, we hash it and we compare it against all the other nodes that are in our system to distribute the load equally between these nodes. So the request comes in, we hash the key, we figure out, hey, does this need to live on this node or do we need to proxy the request to a different node which will have the data. And there's a lot more complexity that comes into this. Like for example, if I dynamically add a new node, I'd have to figure out a way to migrate data from old nodes into the new node. And if I were to delete a node, I have to figure out ways to migrate the data from that was on that node to the existing nodes. But I'm not gonna dive into that just yet. I haven't figured that out. All right, so how does that work in the Go code? Cause I actually did do a lot of refactoring to the Go code. You'll see here, instead of it just having a giant main file, I split stuff up into different subfolders and packages. So I have a proxy, Folder that's basically used for proxying to the other nodes in the system by hostname. I have a disk.go, which is used for storing and retrieving stuff from disk. I have messaging, which is used for publishing and reading from RabbitMQ. I have a hash, which is setting up something called a hash, a consistent hash ring, which I'll talk about in a second, but it's a bit, basically a way to know where I should be distributing these nodes, um, the, the data to the nodes. And then I have a cache. So learning about this, it was all fun and go. There's some more stuff that I learned about like mutexes. I had different go routines trying to read and write from the same map. So I had to like learn about what a mutex is and how to get that set up. And basically you have to add locks to make writing and reading from a, the same data structure exclusive. But let's go back to the application. So how does this work? Basically when someone does a post request, we get the JSON that was sent in. And then we also look at the key and we say, you know what, figure out what node this data needs to live on. They all have the exact same hashing algorithm. So even if I have four pods, they all should be running the same algorithm to figure out where this data needs to live. And I compare the node host name that was given from the hashing algorithm. And I compare it against my current host name that was deployed for the pod. This is something that I think is built in by default into Go. When you deploy a service, you get a host name environment variable. So I say, you know what, if, the request made, if it should be living on this current node, I go ahead and just store it in cache like we did before, and then I write a response header. Otherwise, we know what node in the system should be storing this data, right? So I basically just run a, a function to forward the request to that other node, and then that node will run the exact same logic and probably hit this path where it knows it needs to store this data into itself. Okay, so there's basically, I don't have a load balancer in front of all this stuff. Every node acts as its own load balancer and it forwards one additional request to the node that it needs to live on. I don't know what the performance implications are for that, but I thought it was a lot easier to set up than having to like set up yet another load balancer service, bring in Nginx, try to figure out how to configure that based on keys and hash those keys. I'm sure there's some existing solution that does this, um, but I figured just writing it in Go directly into my HTTP servers would be the easiest. Now, same thing with the get request. If I go up here, when someone makes a get request to this endpoint, we do the same thing. We figure out what node this data lives on. If it currently lives on the node that got the request, we just go ahead and you know check some dirty cache stuff and we load from disk and we send that back. Exactly how it was working before. But the difference is if we got a request that should be living on a different node, like the data lives on a different node, we forward that request to that secondary node we get the data back, we get the response back, and we basically just proxy that to the user. The very last thing that I worked on was I brought in a service or a library called K6. This is also provided by Grafana, which is basically a way to write load tests. So I've been kind of load testing these clusters and load testing my Go application locally just to see like how many requests per second can this thing handle. K6 is interesting because it uses JavaScript. So even though I tried to get away from JavaScript and learn more about Go, we're here back learning more about JavaScript for load testing. But the way this works is you basically write a function that's exported by default, and then you run something, right? So in our case, we're saying write key, and that's going to basically just do a post request to some random key location with my locally running service, and it's gonna store some data. And so if you have these services running locally, which I don't, you basically say k6 run, you pass it your load test script, and then it's going to create almost like a thousand virtual 
um, users and just keep on hitting your endpoints. And at the very end, it tells you like what's the average response time, what are the requests per second that you're getting, et cetera. So I've been kind of playing around with that, just trying to understand like, is this stuff performant that I'm writing? What are the, the bottlenecks? What are the limitations? Yeah, maybe we'll dive more into that next time. But that's all I want to share with you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed um, this overview of the things that I've been learning. If you did, give me a thumbs up, comment, subscribe. And also, I've got a Discord channel. You guys are welcome to join if you want to find a place to hang out or talk to some other developers. Have a good day and happy coding.